Okay, uh, good evening to all of you. We are going to start uh, a new lesson today and we are going to start uh, correlational research. Now, in the previous sessions, I have delivered uh, information about uh, how to basically design the research, how to understand your variables, how to identify your independent variable, how to identify your dependent variable, how to operationalize your variables. And then again, uh, we uh, had our lesson on measurements as well, where we discuss in depth about all of this. And then I also took you through some of the descriptive techniques in research. And in addition to that, in the uh, previous week, I also uh, gave information about how to go ahead and uh, what do you call write a basic research report how to work on improving your writing skills and also what exactly entails in a research paper. Now, with that, today I want to focus a little bit on a specific type of research and that is correlational research. Now, if you go through the published literature, you would never find anything called you know, correlational research per se. You will find correlations on different things. But uh, it's very rare that someone would actually publish something purely based on correlations. But see, that's okay. What we try to do here today is to understand how to do correlations. But because of that, I would call this correlational research and no other reasons okay, behind uh, myself calling this correlational research. So then without calling it correlational research, I would actually say correlations so that it would make more sense. Okay. Now, with that, I'm going to just uh, share my screen here. Okay, so correlational research or rather correlations. Now, what are the learning outcomes of today's session? So uh, we'll be discussing about the assumptions that are required to run a correlational research. And also we'll be discussing about the Spearman and Pearson correlations. So there are two types of correlations, Pearson, Spearman. There are other types of correlations as well, point by serial correlation, tetrachoric uh, correlation, polyphoric correlation. So we are not going to discuss those. Uh, today in this lesson, we'll be focusing only on Pearson correlations and Spearman correlations. Now, uh, let's first look at this image that you see here. If you notice, here, this is what we call the scatter plot. Okay, so here, this is the x-axis. Sorry, this is the x-axis. So this is the x-axis, the uh, horizontal one. And here you have the y-axis, the vertical one. Now, the vertical side, you would see the grades. And on the horizontal side, you would see the hours studied. Now, if you just go through this here, each point that you see is a specific data point. But this data point demonstrates scores for two variables by a specific individual. Now, Let's read this first. It says correlations look at the relationship between X and Y. Now, think about a study where you have two variables. You call your one of your variables the X variable and another variable the Y variable. For example, let's say X is the number of hours studied and Y is the grade. Now, let's say there are 30 students who have participated in this study, which means they have informed you about how many hours they studied and what was the grade exactly they got. Now, these dots that you see here are those data points. Now, for example, if you get this first data point, this first person, let's say that's the first person, he has studied roughly about four hours and has scored about 68. So, this dot corresponds with the x-axis and also it corresponds with the y-axis. So four hours and a 68 or so a score. Now, if you get this point right in the middle, has studied about 15, 16 hours and has a score of 85. If you get this last one over here, that's about 25 hours of study and 90 plus marks. And you can keep on plotting all this data. But now here we are interested in identifying, okay, number of hours studied and the grade. What kind of a relationship is here? Now, this could be a negative relationship. This could be a positive relationship. So right now we don't know. But how are we going to find this? You can find this by just observing 
the nature of the data that you have plotted. So without doing anything, if you just look at this and if you just keep on enveloping the data that you have just plotted, it seems like there's an upward trend from left to right. There's an upward trend. So from if you consider uh, the relationship between X and Y in this example, it's a positive one because it keeps on increasing. See, the more you study, the higher you score. See, the more you study, the higher you score. So it's a very positive trend. Now, this is something that I can just observe from my plot and understand. Now, obviously, not every correlation uh, will be this visible. Some of the relationships might have data from here and there. So then you might not be able to directly pick up okay, whether it is positive or negative. But just for the example, so that we can understand, this is exactly how that is going to work. Okay. Now, with that, let's just try to understand what this thing right here is. This is what we call the correlation coefficient. Now, this R, simple R, demonstrates Pearson correlation. And it says this is a Pearson correlation and it has a value of 0 0.89. 0 0.89 is the coefficient that explains this particular relationship. It's a positive correlation and the coefficient is 0 0.89. Now we'll discuss and we'll try to understand what this coefficient exactly means, okay? So whatever the correlation that you do, the resulting coefficient will always vary between negative one and positive one, okay? So the closer it is to one, the closer it is to a perfect correlation. So plus one means a perfect positive correlation. Negative one means a perfect negative correlation. Now, this is a positive correlation. But if it is on the, uh, if it is, for example, it starts, you know, all the way at the top here, and then it comes all the way down as it goes from left to right. Now here, left to right, you see an upward trend, but what if there's a downward trend where it starts all the way from the top and goes all the way down, which means when X increases, Y decreases. Here, X increases, Y also increases. That's a positive correlation. When X increases, Y decreases means that's a negative correlation. So a negative correlation, once again, if it is a stronger correlation, then your coefficient has to be closer to negative one. If it is closer to zero, but negative, which means it's a negative correlation, but it is not very strong. Now 0.89 means it's closer to one. So it's a very strong correlation. But if it is closer to zero, it could be positive, but it is not strong. Okay, so that is just how this would work. So the coefficients would always change, uh, vary from a negative one to positive one. And in real life, it's very difficult to find a perfect correlation. You don't find perfect correlations because that is not just how the world would work. Usually you would find correlations in, you might find in 0 0.8s, 0 0.9s, but one is not very easy. I am not here in a position to say whether it is an impossible task or not, uh, mainly because, you know, that would require me to go through another lesson. But I have uploaded another lesson to my YouTube channel uh, under Egan Journal on how to do fact analysis. There I'll be actually talking more about these kind of correlations. So if you want my commentary on that, you should watch that video. I'll give the link down below so that you could uh, watch it as well. So this will vary from negative one to positive one. So the sign actually tell us the nature of the correlation. Now here it is a positive correlation because when you do a positive correlation, it is not required for you to put a positive sign per se. But when you have a negative correlation, you always put the sign here. So R equals negative 0.89 means the negative correlation. So this correlation coefficient gives you quite a lot of information. If it is just simple R, then you know it's a Pearson correlation. So because for Spearman, the symbol would be different. And then by this value, you understand whether it's a stronger correlation or a weaker correlation. And by, whether it, by understanding whether it is positive or negative, you can get a better understanding about the nature of your correlation as well. Okay, so that is something that you can always do. Now, these are the directions that we already discussed. Now, this is a positive correlation. As we discussed, there's an upward trend from left to right. So as X increases, Y increases as well. 
Now this one right here in the middle, this one is a downward trend. It's negative. When X increases, Y decreases. And this is what we call a no correlation. So in a no correlation, if you draw the line, the, dry, uh, the line will be actually, uh, that will be parallel to the X axis. So this particular line that we draw is what we call the best fit line or the regression line. This line will demonstrate what kind of a relationship the two variables would actually share. Okay, so that is exactly what we'll be doing in this particular lesson, understanding what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. Okay, now before we go ahead and understand more about correlations, now let's just try to understand how one could understand more about the strength of the correlation. Now, there are events guidelines and also there are Cohen's guidelines. I personally use these guidelines. So, uh, if your correlation coefficient is 0 0.10 or less, it's a small or a weaker correlation. If it is between 0 0.30, if it's in that range, you know, 0 0.30 to 0 0.5. So if that's the kind of the range that you are talking about, then that's a moderate correlation. But if it's more than 0 0.5, 0 0.5 or above, then that's a larger or a stronger correlation. So going back to the example that we already discussed here, the coefficient is 0 0.89. So 0 0.89 is more than 0 0.5. So then this is a stronger correlation. And anyways, it is closer to one. So you should know that it's a stronger correlation. So this is very good for us to understand the strength of a correlation. And with that, let's try to understand more about how one could interpret a correlation. Now, in terms of interpreting correlations, now we know if it says R is equal to 0 0.40, here say, uh, see here, R is equal to 0 0.40, which means the moderate correlation. Now we know the guideline, it's a moderate positive correlation. Still, there's upward trend, it's a positive correlation, but not a very strong one, it's moderate in its strength. Now, there is something called the coefficient of determination. Whatever the coefficient that you get from your correlation, if you square that value, then that would be R squared because R is just correlation. R squared means whatever the coefficient that you got, you square that value, then you get coefficient of determination. So this coefficient of determination actually tells us the variability in Y that is explained by its relationship with X. Now, let me explain this to you a little bit. Now, let's think about a particular study where you are interested in understanding the distance a person walks and the water intake. Now, let's say the more you walk, the more water you will drink. Or the more water you will drink, the more distance you will walk. Now, this is a correlational study that one could do. So we are interested in understanding the relationship between the water intake and the distance a person could walk. Hypothetically, let's think this particular study has yielded the correlation of 0 0.40, which means it's a moderate correlation. Now, you can actually square this value. So 0 0.40 times 0 0.40. So let's actually take a moment to make this calculation just to see whether what I have written here is actually correct or not, okay? So 0 0.40 times 0 0.40 and that is 0 0.16. 0 0.16, now you make it to a, you convert it to a percentage and that is 16%. So 16% of the time, the distance the person walks is explained by the water intake or 16% of the times the water intake of a person is explained by the distance the person walks. Now, why, why, why is exactly 16%? But how about the 84%? See, we are talking about the distance and the water intake, but there could be a lot of other things that will uh, influence a person's ability to walk. For example, the type of shoes he is wearing the type of support he is getting from the peers or the observers, or maybe the temperature, humidity, the terrain the person 
keeps on you know walking so all these things have an impact on the distance a person walks so then the distance that a person walks cannot be solely attributed to the water intake of a person water intake also might have a, a very big impact on a person now based on this it has an impact noticeable impact but not you know a massive impact per se so but what we have to understand is there are a lot of other things that are impacting as well now in an experimental study you will be controlling everything else the extraneous variables now whatever the other variables that are impacting our uh, studies from ex from whatever the external variables that we have if we think those are impacting our study then those are extraneous variables now here the type of shoe the person uh, wears the temperature uh, the terrain kind of support people give to the runners or the people who walk or if you wear, if you keep on listening to music the nature of the music now all these things will have an impact on the distance now those are extraneous variables ideally in an experimental setting you have to control these extraneous variables so that you can study only these two variables the distance and the water intake but in a correlational study, you are not doing an experiment. Since you are not doing an experiment, there is no reason for you to go ahead and do that kind of control or controlling of such extraneous variables. So you are not required to do that. And as a result, there will be always influence coming from extraneous variables to your study if you do a correlation. So that's why once we get our correlation coefficient, we can just square it up so that we can understand the variability in one of the variables as explained by the other variable. So this is what happens in uh, coefficient of determination. Okay. So once again, this is a positive correlation, no correlation, and this is a negative correlation. Now let's try to understand what are the strengths of a correlation. Now, uh, correlations are very good to investigate existing relationships without having to manipulate. Now, you know, in experimental research, you would have to manipulate one of the variables. Uh, but in correlational research, you are not required to manipulate any variable. So, right, I think I still haven't discussed about experimental research in depth. But once we discuss this lesson, the experimental research, like to understand experimental research would be far more easier. So if you don't understand what exactly is meant by manipulation, please don't worry because in the next lecture, I will explain what that manipulation actually looks like. Okay, so uh, that is something that I wanted to explain. And then uh, you don't need to actually do any manipulation here. So all you got to do is basically gather that information and get the particular data related to the two variables and then running the analysis so that's the only thing that you would require to do so the correlations it just uh, study the relationships so you don't require to exert any control to understand more about the nature of uh, these particular variables so that is not required in correlational research. So you just have to get your data and then run the analysis. You will be exerting no control. And uh, so these are some of the strengths. And in addition to that, more than the strengths, I need to talk about correlations because there are some weaknesses in correlational approach. For example, there's a directionality problem. For example, now, when I gave you that example, the distance a person walks and the water intake, we don't know whether it is the distance that influences the water intake or whether the water intake that actually influences the distance. We have no idea about it. We have no clear clue about it. So in correlational studies, we have this directionality problem. We don't know whether X causes Y or Y causes X. Uh, if you think about most of the correlational studies, that's the case. And at the same time, there is something called the third variable problem. So now we know the distance the person walks and the water intake are the variables that we have. But as per the coefficient of determination that we did, it's just 16%. So variability of Y is explained 
by the variable x only 16 percent of the time so which means the rest of the times there are certain other things that is impacting the study so we know x and y share a relationship but at the same time we know there are a lot of other extraneous variables influencing this as well so there is always a third variable problem in the correlational approach so that is also something that we might have to understand when we try to learn more about correlations now i told you that there are two types of correlations one is the pearson correlation and then we have spearman correlation as well so what are the assumptions that one need to possess in order to run a pearson correlation what are the assumptions that one has to meet to run a pearson correlation so before we discuss about spearman we'll discuss first pearson correlation now, in Pearson correlation, if you are to run a correlation analysis, now your two variables, it has to be either interval or ratio level data, which means you can't use categorical data to run a Pearson correlation. A Pearson correlation should have proper numbers, and at the same time, there needs to be some form of a linear relationship. So, for example, the number of hours you study and the uh, the grade that you would obtain, there is a linear relationship so in addition to this linear relationship you need to also have normally distributed data your data normally being your data being normally distributed means you know it shouldn't be skewed so it shouldn't have you know uh, uh, kurtosis values which are you know in extremes for example if the kurtosis value is more than plus two or something like that then uh, maybe just like the one that you see here maybe your data is two point so your data being two point once again indicates that your data is not normal and if your data is skewed see if your data is gathered towards the left side or to the right side then your data is skewed so that means your data is not normally distributed so you got to make sure your data is normally distributed as well so if your data is normally distributed then you have made that assumption as well so you have normal data you have a linear relationship which you are assuming and the same time you have interval or ratio level data you can go ahead and run a pearson correlation so all good now there's another way that you can check actually uh, normality of your data on SPSS, you can run Komogorov, Smirno, and Shapiro Wilk tests. So, by running these two tests, you can also understand more about uh, the what do you call the methods of testing normality. Okay, so that is one of those methods that uh, you can use to run or understand more about the normality of your data. So uh, SPSS can be used to understand more about normality. If not, uh, you can simply uh, do a, what you call a, 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 a histogram. You can uh, use your data to come up with a histogram and then you can observe the nature of your data. So if you can draw a histogram and obtain the normality curve, you can observe whether your data is normal, distributed or not. This is a process that you can use to visually observe whether your data is normal or not. So in instances where you don't know how to run uh, the normality testing on SPSS, this is something that you can do where you can observe things uh, using uh, the graphs and you know the stuff like histograms. Now, that is Pearson correlation. So you need to have two continuous variables and normality is a must. But what if normality is violated? If normality is violated, then you can actually go ahead and study. Uh, sorry, you can go ahead and use Spearman correlation. So in this Spearman correlation, you can do it if your normality is violated. But at the same time here, you don't need to have two continuous variables. One of your variables could be a continuous variable and another variable could be ordinal. Now, let's go back to the same example. Number of hours studied and the grade. What if here the grade is denoted by letters like A, B, C, D without necessarily using the uh, numbers? For example, 100 is safe. 90s B, 
80s C, 70s D. So this is then, that's the ordinal variable because it's categories, but in a, uh, uh, specific, it demonstrates a specific trend of increments, and this is a continuous variable. So that's a continuous variable and an ordinal variable studied together, or analyzed together. Now for that also, a Spearman correlation analysis is required because Spearman allows you to have one continuous variable and one uh, ordinal variable, and here normality is not required. So whenever you want to do a correlational analysis, it's extremely important that you have a good understanding about the nature of the variables that you have and also the particular type of data that you are actually dealing with. So that is a very important thing that you got to you know, do when you think about correlations. And you can use SPSS to run uh, correlations, but at the same time you can do uh, correlations via Excel as well. So I'll demonstrate how to run a correlation through Excel using the Corel function. But before we go through that, so let's try to understand more about correlations, okay? Uh, so now we know how exactly the correlation has to be considered and what kind of assumption needs to be there. So based on these assumptions and based on the type of data that you have, you can either consider a, a Pearson correlation. If not, you can consider a Spearman correlation. So some call this the Spearman correlation rho or RS, and it is denoted by, uh, sorry, rho or RHO, and it's denoted by RS. Now, with that, now we discussed about normal distribution. So this is normally distributed data. So if you have a left skew, your data would look like this. That's the nature of the data that you have. And this is the right skew. So if you visually observe your data, for example, in the previous example, the number of hours studied and the score, if the scores are not normally distributed like this, but skewed, then you know your data has some issues. So in that sense, even if you don't run a SPSS analysis on finding normality, just by looking at this, you know your normality is not met. So then you can actually go ahead and do a Spearman correlation. And also Spearman correlation is very good for monotonic relationships. Now, these are monotonic relationships. Now here on the right side, what you see here is a linear relationship. See here, the data indicates an upward trend. But this one is not linear. This is a nonlinear relationship. So uh, Spearman is actually good with nonlinear uh, monotonic relationships as well. So this is monotonically increasing. This is monotonically decreasing. And this is non-monotonic data. So I have given different types of relationships here. Linear relationships, positive linear relationship, negative curvilinear relationships. This is once again another curvilinear relationship and all of that. So now, of course, now as a researcher, it is very difficult for us to understand what kind of a relationship is a monotonic relationship. But as a rule of thumb, what we usually do is we start with a correlation. We see whether the normality has been met and you don't need to run correlations for everything. You have to critically decide before you start to do a correlation whether a correlation would be actually worthwhile for the analysis that you are talking about. So if you know the particular analysis that you want to, the particular study that you are doing, if there are two variables and you know a correlation wouldn't be the ideal method to go for it, then you there is no reason for you to go for it. But here what we try to do is to have some understanding in what kind of circumstances one has to run the correlation analysis, okay? So, uh, just so that you would know what exactly is a linear relationship and what exactly is a monotonic relationship. So that's the thing. So we usually target linear relationships, but uh, it's very important that you find whether it is normal or not so that you can actually proceed with your analysis. So as I told earlier, Spearman is denoted by RS. So uh, the S has to be actually... Uh, subscript so it has to be like this so uh, there is something that we could do okay so this is the spearman correlation the symbol that is used to you know denote and then uh, pearson is r spearman is rs 
So that is something that you could just note as well. Now here, in the very first example that we did, R denotes Pearson. But if you have R is here, then you know it is Spearman. So then the moment you see Spearman, then you know either your data is not normally distributed, or if not, you have some ordinal data as well. Okay. Okay. So that is something that you would immediately know. Now, this is a perfect negative correlation, Spearman, no correlation, and then uh, positive correlation. Now, let's try to read some findings here. Let's say now, there's a person who has done the study, and the study is the role of organizational commitment and job autonomy in influencing turnover intentions. Now, this is the study, okay? Organizational commitment, job autonomy in influencing turnover intentions. Now, what you see here is a correlational matrix because here you have three variables and they have put the, uh, the relationships between each one of these. Each, they have considered, you know, pairs, like one, two variables taken at a time and they have run correlations. So here you see three variables, the same three variables appear here. So this is a correlation matrix. So turnover intentions with turnover intentions, of course, it has to be one because it's the same variable. But if you think about turnover intentions and autonomy in the workplace, it has a coefficient of negative 0 0.340. Turnover intentions and organizational commitment has a negative 0.396. Now, here's the tricky part. When you want to express what exactly is mentioned in a correlational study, you got to understand first the research title or what exactly they are going to do in this research. So here they want to study organizational commitment and job autonomy to see whether it has something to do with turnover intentions. Turnover intention means someone's desire to leave the organization. So probably I'm thinking if someone is committed, if someone has great autonomy at work, there is no reason to leave that job. Now let's see whether that is reflected in our data. Turnover intention. So my intentions to leave the organization is negatively related to autonomy at work. If I feel that I have autonomy at work, why would I leave? So there's a moderate correlation, a moderate negative correlation, which means when the autonomy is high, turnover intentions are low. Or when the autonomy is low, turnover intentions are high. The same goes with turnover intentions and commitment as well. See, negative 0.396. If someone is committed, the reason to leave the organization is low. If someone is not committed, the chances of leaving the organization is high. So now, this is exactly what is explained in both of these. So I hope you would understand because here, see, based on the coefficient that you see, it is a negative correlation. A negative correlation means when X increases, Y decreases. So turnover intentions go up, autonomy comes down. So if someone won't leave, then probably he is not someone who feels they have autonomy in the workplace. So they have any, uh, probably they don't have good organizational commitment as well. But if you think about autonomy and commitment, autonomy and commitment, that is a positive correlation. See, 0 0.345, it's once again a moderate correlation, but it's a positive correlation. Why? Because if someone is autonomous, then probably he's committed there as well. See, now you have to understand this along with theory. Theoretically, if you think about this, someone who is committed to work might also feel they are autonomous at work as well. So both these are positively correlated constructs. But the only moment where you would see a negative correlation of both of these is would uh, is with you know the turnover intention. So turnover intentions means desire to leave the job. So if I have intent to leave, then yes, I might not have the same commitment or I might not have the same autonomy at work. So whenever you go through your results, whenever you want to interpret it, you have to bit of you know you have to figure this out using the theory that you have put on your research paper as well. For example, if you have chosen a specific theory to 
uh, build up your research you can utilize this to understand more about the nature of your findings but even if you disregard that this is exactly what it would say and you can report it like this so i have given uh, we i have just noted one of the results here so the association between turnover intentions and organizational commitment is moderate and then you put a comma and then you write this is pmn correlation rs equal to negative 0.396 comma r squared r squared would be coefficient of determination equals 16 percent so this is how you would note your or report your findings so i have given more information on how you should do the reporting now here in this one i have just given them in uh, the point order but you don't need to uh, write like that when you write your research paper you can write this in the form of a paragraph so based on the results of the study job autonomy and turnover intentions has a significant negative correlation then you write rs equals negative 0 0.340 and then comma and then you write your p-value indicating the research is significant okay so likewise i have given the information here like how exactly you need to go ahead and uh, do your reporting okay and you can do this on spss if you are do this through spss uh, once you add all your data you can uh, click on analyze and then correlate and then select bivariate and then uh, it will give you a box like this where you have to select your variables as you see i have put the variables here turnover intentions autonomy organizational commitment and then here you can select what kind of a correlation you need to run so you can select pearson or spearman or kendall tau so here i have chosen spearman and then the type of significance is is, is it a two-tailed study or is it a one-tailed study so we haven't discussed this in depth as of yet but here i'm selecting a two-tailed study and then i hit ok and then it will run my analysis now this is how you are going to do this through spss but now i am going to show you how exactly you are going to do this through excel okay okay so give me a minute okay so now let's go through an excel document and let's try to see how exactly we can run a correlational analysis okay so let me share my screen here now this is microsoft excel so we don't always need to have spss especially for correlations we can quickly run them through excel okay now here i am going to explain the study that we are interested in doing this is of course a hypothetical study so it is not theoretically rigorous or so anything i just want to show how to draw a very simple correlation okay now let's read this community in goal who are interested in finding the association between alcohol intake and money saving now i have seen quite a lot of individuals who consume alcohol so i'm not against it so i i don't want to tell or comment about it but just let's hypothetically think that if someone continues to drink every day, that might have a bit of an issue when it comes to their investments or personal money management. So I'm going to just study this. So how, what am I going to do? I'm going to study the alcohol intake per week. So now I need to be very specific about how I will be measuring the alcohol intake per week. But in this, I am going to think about the number of 30 milliliter shots a person would consume in a given week now of course people might not take a uh, have a tab on you know how much they have drunk but let's just uh, assume in this particular sample they have done this they know perfectly how much they have uh, consumed alcohol but i'm i'll be consume i'll be noting down how many 30 ml shots so i'll be counting how many shots people have taken not exactly milliliter amounts okay and then i'll be noting down the number of money saved by dollars and so let's just read this now here look at this table right here here you have your participants i have 10 participants john kurt jason randall joshua kate lori catherine and christine now john has consumed 10 shots of alcohol in the previous week and he has saved hundred dollars randall has consumed 15 and he has saved 90. lori has consumed 42 
and she has managed to save only 20. Christine has consumed 20 and she has managed to save only 55. Now, in addition to this, alcohol and money saved, I also have written a bit about satisfaction. So let's say satisfaction is measured from 0 to 10. So this person, John, is satisfied a little bit. His score is 5. The most satisfied person is Randall. He has a score of 10. And is also highly satisfied. She also has a score of 10. Now, here's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to draw a graph about the alcohol intake and money saved to understand more about the nature of relationship that we have here. Okay, So that would be the first step that I'm going to do. Now, let's take a moment. Here's what you are going to do. So, take your mouse and just drag it and highlight this area. Alcohol intake and money saved. See the first column and the second column. Now, both I have highlighted so the most important thing is first you put your data on excel in the table format so it's very clear how i have done this one column i have participants one column i have alcohol intake one column i have money saved and one column i have satisfaction so i don't need to know which participant has done which when i put them on the scatter plot but here i have all that information so i know who has consumed which amount and how much they have saved so i am going to just drag alcohol intake and money saved here and then i'm going to click on just insert button and then it has recommended charts and right next to the recommended charts see here this particular button xy scatter you going you need to click on this and then you select the first option here where it says scatter plot Oh, now I'm going to get this scatter plot and I'm going to keep it right here. Now, before we do anything, let's just focus on the type of data that you have here. See, what do you think about the nature of this data? Do you think it's going to be a positive correlation or a negative correlation? See, if I just envelope this data using a pen or pencil or something, does it show an upward trend or does it show a downward trend? Well, it looks like there is a downward trend. As X increases, Y seem to have decreased. It's very visible, right? But you can get the best fit line for this. Click on the quick layout if you are using a Mac and then go for this. Layout 3. Oh, now I have my best fit line. So you can change the x-axis and y-axis and stuff like that uh, by simply clicking here. And then you can see this is the negative correlation. But now I need to know whether this correlation is a strong correlation or whether it's a weak correlation. So how am I going to do? So here's exactly how I'm going to do through Excel. See, alcohol and money saved. I already have found this answer, but I'm going to just do it again. So in any place you don't need to write all of this but in any place now here i have actually written it alcohol and money saved correlation coefficient so please first write the equal mark and then you need to write this c o r r e l this is the function that you need to use on excel c o r r e l that's the corel function you click on this and then it says select the array one Separate by a comma and then select array 2. Now don't click on alcohol intake, the label. Select the numbers and then you drag it all the way down. This is your array 1. You select your array 1 and then you put a comma again like this. And now it says, okay, now select your array 2. Now I'm going to select my array 2. Okay, I have selected my second array as well. See, now this is a logic, right? I have my function corel which has selected the first array that's the first variable the data and you have put a comma and then you have selected the second variable and it has already put the, the the closing bracket as well so i don't need to do anything i have written everything properly and then i just press enter okay see negative point seven one four three eight now this is a negative correlation and I know it's a strong correlation because it's more than 0 0.5. Anything more than 0 0.5, based on the guidelines that we discussed, it's a stronger correlation. So 0 0.7 is a stronger correlation. But the only difference here is that this is a negative correlation. So it's a negative correlation. 
and very similar to this, I have done for alcohol and satisfaction. Alcohol and satisfaction also has a correlation of 0 0.24, and that's a positive correlation. Maybe this is not the most expected results, but at least based on the data that I have obtained, people who have consumed alcohol have found some amount of satisfaction as well. But you can't generalize this by saying, you know, this is how exactly, you know, it's going to work for everybody. So we don't know about that. But this is just how and what we can say just by looking at this particular piece of information. Now, how are you going to report your findings? So I have written how to do this reporting as well. As per the findings, the community data in goal indicates that most of the people tend to save less money the more they drink alcohol. So R, this is Pearson correlation, okay? So R is equal to 0 0.71, negative 0 0.71. However, with the increased alcohol intake, people have indicated a slice enhancement in their happiness. So R, once again, equals to 0 0.27 because satisfaction score has gone up. That is what we observed in the data. Now, this is exactly how you would do a correlational analysis. Now, this is not very hard. This is one of the easiest analysis one could do in quantitative research. And in this particular course, I will be mainly focusing on correlations only because this is introductory level research. So I'll be just focusing on this one and I will take you through more sample research in future lessons as well so that you would have a better understanding about what exactly we'll be discussing. And in addition to that, I will be uh, utilizing two of our weeks to understand more about qualitative research as well. So altogether, you would have a, a better understanding about research in general. So since this the, this particular course is intended for first year students, I hope that this will give you a bit of an understanding about how to approach a particular study, what kind of data can be gathered, and thereby what kind of analysis can be completed as well. So this is a correlational research. And through this, you would be able to understand more about the nature of the data that you have and what kind of uh, results or findings that one could reveal from the data that they have uh, with them, okay? So that is exactly, uh, uh, that exactly was my intention. So correlations, of course, can be utilized for a lot of other things. If you go for validity, and stuff like that uh, in psychometrics correlations of course can be utilized quite well as i said there's another video about psychometrics that i have done which i will link it to here so that you can go ahead and watch that to understand more about what kind of work you can do using correlations but for the time being this is a very good start so i'm uh, happy with uh, where things are going how things are moving forward so uh, thank you very much for all of you uh, for joining uh, uh, with me today. So yeah, so if you have any questions, you can uh, send me a message or just comment down below. So thank you very much. And I will see you again with a similar lecture in uh, the upcoming week. So thank you very much.